Hey, hey, everybody, this is Project Kids Summer Camp number five. And um, we were just kind of, Michael and I and Laura, we were just kind of chatting a little bit about the unusual skies we've been witnessing and we decided to push record so we don't miss anything good. We're going to do our usual kind of hour or so here with Michael and I, and then we'll break off and go into the workshop with the group. So welcome to everybody who's here. Hello, Michael. And uh, let's just get right back into the sky. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, let's ju just jump right back in because it's so timely. Like it, literally I was having the same sort of conversation. I was talking about, uh, I took a walk this morning with Jenny and I was pointing out at a cloud and I say it half joking, but like, you know, uh, I was like, that's the cloud type, which you have when you're hiding an object. Yep. I you know, and, and, and so I was pointing that out again this, this morning, but, but the thing which I think is most interesting, at least from my experience and looking at the skies right about now, it's purely subjective. And I'm always like, I'm, I, 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 I question myself and anyone else when it comes to subjective analysis. Like, I think there's a place for it, but I, I hold it like, you know, in a special place. Like, I know, like, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing things that I can't quite say, like, you know, that's, I'm measuring it or what have you. But, but the fact that we're all kind of picking up the same thing right now takes it to me, or for me, it goes from just purely being a subjective observation to being objective, the fact that it's happening to us and we didn't decide to talk about this beforehand. Like we're noticing th something about the subtleties of the colors, the subtleties about like maybe just the fact that it's calling our attention more so than normally. Yeah, no, absolutely. That It is interesting that we're all kind of with the same colors. A lot of times people are seeing uh, stuff in the sky, but it's, you know, maybe different in my location than yours or whatnot, right? But yesterday, what we saw, so speaking to what you said about, um, like, the kind of clouds that cover an object, right? Like, obviously, I've done extensive interviews with Sean Gattreau, who his work is all about the cloud-cloaked craft in the sky, but also for many, many years, I've been seeing what I would term, like, astral cities in the sky that seem to be covered by clouds where you can still sort of see this, a little bit of the structure, but it's like in the clouds and every once in a while you'll get a peep at something else. And I was telling you, Laura, yesterday when we were on our morning donut drive around the city that I was telling her about like the most incredible astral city I ever saw in the sky was when I lived downtown and I was driving back home from Santa Monica and I saw an astral city in the sky, but it was very low, right? Just hovering above downtown Los Angeles. And at one point, whatever the clouds were trying to cover slipped out a little bit on one side, right? Mm -hmm. and what it kind of looked like was some sort of combination between like castles and like a, like a, a platform you would see like on an oil rig that had all those like mechanical kinds of things that, you know what I'm talking about? Like a, an oil rig platform you see in the ocean. Like it looked kind of like that. And it was just literally hovering there what seemed like just a few hundred feet above downtown Los Angeles. And then very quickly, the cloud sort of moved back over and covered it up almost like it was aware, oops, we had let our cover go, right? Um, but this speaks to a lot of stuff. I mean, obviously we've heard in like religious and mythical texts that like, you know, there'll come a day where we'll see something in the sky kind of thing, all the Native American stuff. Also, Tracy Twyman talked about like there all this stuff is covering something that's going on in the sky and at a certain point they're not going to be able to hide it and she related this to some of her plus ultra like MK ultra children's club at Disneyland kind of research and that there's like an access point to get up there type of thing and then this is also like what FPD Angel is talking about that like whatever is going on with the machinery and the underground realms is reflected in the sky like we're seeing the evidence of it in the sky and that reflection is also on a certain, it has its own abilities. It's like a technology as well. It's different than the machine, but it actually does interact in almost a um, like cyclical or machine type or, or, or predictable behavior type way with things that are supposedly real in the atmosphere and not just reflective, right? So there's something very weird going on up there and, um, wasn't there like about a month ago, wasn't there like a whole bunch of stories about um, uh, like in the Los Angeles area about a guy flying around on a jet pack, like really high up in the sky? Oh, I've talked about this and like all there was three or four of these stories a few months ago. Like and this was one of those things like when you and I talk about how Drudge Report is you just read the front page. Right. Mm -hmm. Like like six weeks, like every other week there would be one of. Yeah, these yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> 
And I tell you this part though, the fucking jet packs that they're talking about were manufactured in Chatsworth and you can't get an address for the, the where they're manufactured. They'll say they're in Chatsworth, but they keep it private because they don't want people coming there trying to, you know, find the jet packs and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, no, I mean, like yeah, they replace they replace the they replace the the jetpack story with the with the monolith stories. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The monolith ones got a little bit more attention, um, but th those were sure th those were pretty funny. <laughs> it's like the, the it's like the world tour of monoliths and everything. Then all of them disappear. It's just a very bizarre. Like, what are they trying to? I mean, it's obvious that like. They're trying to direct our attention towards something without saying what it is that they're trying to direct our attention towards because it isn't really the monolith or the jetpack. And the thing which which captures my my interest as it relates to the monolith is um, it's it's not it's not the Stanley Kubrick monolith. Like typically, like uh, there is like a big story how in Seattle on December or January first, two thousand one, like a monolith appeared in one of the uh, in some park in Seattle, and like that's the beginning of if you're familiar with the book of uh, um, Secret Society and Psychological Warfare by by Michael Hoffman, he begins going into that, and so the monoliths that we're seeing now, I I believe that they are three sided and they kind of have like this mirror shape. Um, and what I find is more interesting about that is that it's changed, uh, at least in the story. Like, I'm not like, I'm not saying like there weren't a bunch of like pranksters who are doing it, but what it, what's happening is it's gone into the collective mind and they've changed it a little bit. It went from black to uh, black in rectangular, like a three-dimensional rectangular shape to mirrored and this, this, you know, three-sided shape. So whatever that may mean, you know, who knows, but just pointing out like where it, where it's different is where you could begin to see where the, the, the storyline is changing a bit. Yeah, yeah, they're rewriting scripts, you know what I mean? Just kind of like they do whenever they do a remake of an old movie, right? They keep a few of the things, but they rewrite some aspects of the story. They recast the character as a totally different type or something like that, right? And so this is sort of keeping a certain legend or archetype alive in the social consciousness, but like tapering it and molding it and editing yeah. it to fit uh, the reduced reality <laughs> that we live in. The re Even though it seems like we have way more shit than we used to, don't kid yourself, the reality has been reduced. <laughs> I agree with that. Yeah. So, so where do we want to begin today? All right, so we talked about like, probably I love we, we we did a little pre-show and we talked about like 200 different topics we can do today and somehow when we talk about it before the show we figure like oh yeah we'll be able to fit all that into an hour but the truth of the matter is it's probably one or two right so um you know I don't know where you maybe we should save the like ferris wheel stuff for if we're going to do this thing with howdy this week right it, it, right kind of thing maybe we should do do we could talk about your Kubrick, and I think maybe we could talk about my Santa Fe Trail. You want to do that? Let's start with the Santa Fe Trail. All right, cool. So um, Laura and I were on the cross-country trek, and the whole thing was interesting. We're going to make a wrap-up sort of video about that. But on the way back, we chose to go the slightly less obvious way from Iowa to um, New Mexico, where we were visiting Marcy, who's right here today, <laughs> right? So there was like a way that we could have gone where we would have gone through like Denver and Colorado Springs and blah, blah, blah. But we decided to go kind of the back route through Kansas. And um, it was shorter mileage, but took longer. Yeah, which was shorter mileage, but different kind of highways. So it was going to take a little bit longer. So we decided to do that for some reason. It was pretty easy. I didn't want to go Instinctive. Through. She didn't want to go through Colorado again. Yeah, yeah all that stuff again. Right. So pretty quickly, like at a certain point in Kansas, you pick up the old Santa Fe Trail. The highway that we were on became the old Santa Fe Trail. And like it's different than any of the other roads or highways we took the whole trip. First of all, for like a good portion of the time that we were on it, we were the we didn't see other cars for sometimes a half an hour, sometimes longer. Right. We didn't see it going in either direction or anything really off to the sides, even though there would be structures and in some places animals and things like that. There didn't seem to be other people or normal businesses and things like that. Right. 
The other thing that I noticed is like, I was driving in one stretch of it where like I was having, I have very good vision, but I was really struggling with depth perception at night when there were, which is not a common thing for me ever here, like right ever, where it was like, I couldn't tell if the, if the truck coming was like a mile away or a hundred feet away. So there was something like oddly disorienting or like, you know, psychedelic to almost, right? About, about that visual for me. Um, and so we, we, we kind of noticed the difference be and the little towns along this road were very different. You know, even when they were like, they were different than each other, but just different in general. But at a certain point, we both started to notice this weird phenomena of like, there would be these like farms or homes that appeared to be abandoned in, right off on the side of the road and like old cars that looked like they were from like the 50s or the 60s, but there was no people around, but there was animals on the farms, right? It looked desolate except for the animals. But in some of these places, there was a railroad that like ran across. We didn't really see any moving trains. We saw the trains that are stopped, stuck on the railroad and have like a lot of graffiti on them and stuff like that, right? And we were like, what is going on? right? Who's taking care of all these animals? There are no people. We didn't see a single farm that had people working on it. Mm -hmm. Like on the way there on the other roads, we could see, you could see people out there in their tractor or doing different stuff. And you'd see the um, technology mm -hmm. for irrigating, you know, and spraying the fields. We didn't see any of that on the way back, but you see the animals there. And then these homes and cars that look really, really run down and like, not just old, but from a completely different era. So we started to play around with the idea that like, maybe these homes are places where people who are entering into this reality arrive, right? Mm -hmm. There's some penetration of dimensions or timelines or something like that, right? That they like arrive here and they have, you know, like there's a car maybe with keys and some gas in it so that they can move on kind of thing, even if it's an old one, it doesn't look, you know, it, people are gonna think this is some dilapidated place. So they come into this place, there's a home where they can do whatever they need to do and then go from there. And it, you know, we were like, what is this? Are these portals? And there was all of these on the other side of the freeway from where we would see these farms and cars, there'd be these train tracks with totally stopped trains that look like they haven't moved in years, right? But very well kept up like electrical lining and like power, like weird kind of like other technologies. The railroad was the team that he was working on. Yeah, the, ra the railroad looked up to train. date as well, even though there was no active trains. And we were just like, you know, in both in your work and in my observation, both from like my experiences in Chatsworth and also some of the places my dad likes to take photographs that like some of these heavily graffitied places uh, like are very high energy points for some reason. Like there's some kind of weird chaotic energy crossover point there. So we started noticing this. And then I started, then we got into a conversation about like, it almost felt like rather than moving through time, like moving through uh, something spatially, like you're traveling from this town to this town, it almost felt temporal, right? It felt like um, that, that like some of these locations were like portals to another time, right? Or, or, or something like that. Like it started to feel like we were like in some weird space where like time and space had been sort of reversed and we were moving through time rather than moving through a spatial locations, right? And it was really unusual. And then just the, the very small amount of actual um, other cars we saw, right? That, you know, we had this one thing where like in the middle of an area where there was nothing but these abandoned um, sort of farms or houses, we got, there was this car that like oddly sped past us and then got in front of us and slowed down. And so we were behind it and it eventually turned off into the only property in this, one of these areas that looked functional. Mm -hmm. And it was almost like he wanted to get our attention the way he had insisted on speeding to pass us mm -hmm. and then got in front of us and went really slow. Almost like he wanted us to sort of observe the difference between him, his space and some of these other spaces. It was really odd. And then we ended up, so this was like a day and a half we spent on this, this road. Um, and we ended up in this place called Trinidad, Colorado, which is just on the border of 
New Mexico. It's just a few miles from the border going into New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And this was a really weird town, Michael. Like there was some aspects of it that were pretty modern and some aspects of it that were like old ghost townies. There were some buildings that looked a little bit Tartarian or something like that, right? And it had like, it was a weird hodgepodge of stuff, almost like it is a junction point. Like it has that sort of time travel portal potential about it, right? Like you could access a variety of realms from this junction point. Um, and we had lunch at a restaurant there and then we ended up having to kind of get up and go pretty quickly because all of a sudden the snowstorm came a day earlier than expected, right? And then we had to travel through these snowstorms to sort of get out of town. And once we past the snowstorm areas, like the normal relationship to time and space seemed to have been sort of restored. To the extent that it's ever restored in New Mexico. New Mexico was weird that way anyway, but it wasn't quite the same tone as it was prior to Tr Trinidad and the snowstorm, right? Yeah, like we felt like we were in some weird like, like Westworld, like an old Western, but really like actually like you're in a futuristic space where it's just a fake old west kind of thing or it was very unusual um so was that a good good description of that do you feel so i'm going to kind of toss that over to you and hear some of your thoughts uh, all right all right so first thing is is there a highway number associated with the santa fe trail i think it's route 66 is it no right no, no it's not 64 I, I mean i just tried to do a quick search and i couldn't find any highway number with route uh with the santa fe trail i, I think it changes numbers i think it changes numbers and like i couldn't find them anywhere like i i i spent a lot of times looking at a lot of like roads that go certain places and i and i always and it's always given like particularly in the wikipedia page like all of the like where it changes from this number to that number to that number so either one or two things are happening either um the Santa Fe Trail is only a name, which I think is very unique, or for whatever reason, that's not on any any place which I could find on the internet. So, so if we could find the numbers, I'd be curious what that is. Um, so there's something which you said, which like immediately triggered something in my mind. And the first thing which you said was, uh, you, you use when you're talking about being uh, the the confusion of of depth perception and like you know having difficulty telling where the um, where the where the sky where the sky ends and the earth begins. I don't know if you used exactly that, but what that did to me was it brought back. There's a, a line from the movie Forrest Gump. Okay. And uh, I think it's like towards the end where he's describing like all of the the um, the things which which he's learned in his experience. And he was talking about this one part where he's running and like you know how how beautiful it is where where the uh, where the uh, you can't tell where the sky ends and and the earth begins. And that is always stuck in my mind. It's not like I'm a big Forrest Gump fan or anything. Like I saw it like back in the '90s when it came out, I suppose. But, but I know that when um, when something sticks, particularly when something sticks when there's not like a personal tie to it, like you know something will stick if you go through like your like a a, a personal um, uh, very very high impact experience like you know you have a very large time date stamp in your consciousness of everything that's connected to it like it's a hypnotic anchor mm -hmm. and so what i'm suggesting is that line has a hypnotic anchor in my mind and i don't think for me it's personal because there was nothing that happened other than watching the movie other than the fact that i think that had to do with that movie um a lot which we can tell about um like the the we can understand uh, about the impact, the hypnotic impact uh, popular culture movies have had based upon like the type of response they've had within the collective culture. So I know that Forrest Gump was big and that line that stuck out. So as soon as you said that, I start thinking Forrest Gump. Okay. Now, that being said, you know, I'm talking, I say I'm not a big Forrest Gump fan. Uh, I showed Forrest Gump to, to my sons uh, maybe a month or two ago. Like, you know, I'll, we'll watch movies and, you know, I'll, I'll show movies which uh, for usually selfish reasons, something which I want to study and something which I want them to see and which we could talk about. So I go and I watch Forrest Gump. I haven't probably seen it for 25 years. And I was, I just came out of college when it, when it came out. So I think Forrest Gump came out in 94, 95. So that was probably around the last time I had seen Forrest Gump. And 
I then, after watching the movie again, I did a little bit of research about Forrest Gump and saw that was based upon a book. And in the movie, one of the most interesting aspects or one of like the, you know, the, the things that, that the, the public liked the most was how this Forrest Gump character always finds himself in these um, historically significant events. Like they, they, like they put him in, that's not in the book. So that was completely like a, a Hollywood creation. Like that was like part of the artistic interpretation of the director who did that. I wouldn't say, say Zemeckis, is that the guy's name I maybe? Know, yeah, I think so, most okay. of the movies that are really big are Zemeckis films, yeah. So this, so that is part of the film. And I know this film is significant for a lot of different reasons, just because, you know, it's been successful. So all of this being said is like, um, this movie, oh, and this is the guy who also did, uh, if it's Zemeckis, I think he's also the one behind the Back to the Future films. Uh, if so, that would make it even more interesting. And if you've ever seen the analysis between Back to the Future and I think it was called The Wire with the guy who walked between the train, uh, the twin train ta uh, trade towers. But but this goes along- That's the that. mind, the French guy. Yes, okay. and that and the movie of that, which was done by the same director as as Back to the Future, there are a lot of like uh, similarities in terms of how they're dressed. The most obvious being how the the uh, the guy who crossed the film is dressed exactly like Marty McFly. But all of this has to do with time travel, is what I'm getting at. And you brought right. up time travel. That's why I'm bringing it up again because of this link and what you're saying of like this highway hat being like, is this one of the portals? Because when you see the when you see the Forrest Gump again, like in, with modern eyes, and you see the historical events which they decide to tie it to, um, the first thing that popped out to me, going back to the subjective sort of quality of what we're talking about with like the 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 clouds, was I'm like, this reminds me too much of. Have you ever seen when it shows like celebrities in the old fashion from the from the 1800s photographs? Yeah, and it looks like Jay Z or whatever. Yeah, that's the one. It's the, always the Jay Z fucking one. Yeah. So I'm like, this is what the foot like the Forrest Gump is seemingly like. It's touching on this idea of like, of, of like, you know, whether we want to call it time travel, whether you want to call it like, you know, just like this ability to come in and out of our storyline and affect the storyline. And if you're paying attention to the details, you're going to go and see the same hand. You're going to see the same sort of person. So when you're talking about the Santa Fe and the Santa Fe um, highway is also known as the mother of the railroad. And the railroad is really, really significant within understanding like how our modern world has been told. So that's what's all jumping out. Like, like you're on to that. And then, and then I, I, I pulled up, uh, what was it? Um, what was the town? Trinidad, Colorado. You pull that up. The first, the, probably like midway down, but it's, it's, it's got its own section. It's like, and, and Trinidad is known as the sex change capital of the world. What? Well, okay. So we know, and we've, you know, one of the things you and I have been wanting to dig into for a long time is this combination of like transgender and time travel kind of thing. Right. Fucking fat. Okay. That, that is fucking fascinating. All right, all right. Well, I hate to back off to you. So that's, so that's where it went for me initially. All right. So like I got like time travel, I got like movies, like fake movies too, but like the like clue movies. Um and we really would like to go down like if anyone's ever seen the analysis which was done with like the the wire and and um back to the future because that's all time travel as well. And then what we're seeing with this Forrest Gump and then the seemingly like connection on on the, the Santa Fe. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like okay, if so you're if you're having trouble seeing things and you don't normally have that and you've driven on other long flat highways and you've not come across that same response i would say there's definitely something unique happening within the uh the 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 environment there My, michael whiteman says it's referred to as trim a dad <laughs> So first of all, I just want to say, I haven't seen that movie, The Wire, but for some reason I knew what it was. I haven't seen it, I'll have to go watch it. But I have like 10, 10 points or more here that we can go down. But I just want to bring to your attention because I don't know if you know what it is. 
Laura's doing her research on the side here. She, he, she found a site called geocaching, like cache, like you cache old websites on well, the this internet. Is, this is about the Santa Fe National Trail. And they have a specific geocache that they're doing there with GPS systems and things like that to do. It's a game. It's, so it's there, there, is a, there, game. Is a, there is like a rando nodding thing type, type of thing, an outdoor adventure game that they're doing on the Santa Fe Trail called geocaching or geocaching. So we'll have to look further into that. Laura has the site up and she'll forward it on to, can you put the site link in the chat box sure. on the side? Okay, awesome. All right, so for the first thing- I and, and I want to confirm, Zemeckis did do all those films. Okay, all right, very good. So the first thing when you start talking about uh, the Forrest Gump, because I just saw the movie once too, but like there was something about, the, there's two things about that movie that like wouldn't go away. Obviously the sayings in, in my life, the one that I always heard was, well, life is like a box of chocolates, right? Like that one, right? And I'll, I'll address that next. But the other one, and this is going to be fucking weird, but this is what came to my mind while you were talking. Do you remember there, was, there may, may even still be, but there was a restaurant chain called Bubba Gump Shrimp Company. Yes. Mm hmm Okay. So every city, like I ever lived in or worked in or whatever, lived, most of them at, somewhere had a Bubba Gump Shrimp Company. Right. And I always ended up working at a restaurant where somebody who worked there had worked at a Bubba Grunt Gump Shrimp Company. And each person would tell me the same thing, right? That like it was the best and the worst job they ever had. They made so much fucking money, but it was so fucking annoying, right? Kind of thing. And I heard this from very different people in very different locations around the world. It was almost like, uh, putting it out there as like, well, if you want to make a lot of money, go do this. You're, you know what I mean? It's going to be super fucking annoying. And you're going to be dealing with shit that you like, you know, would never want to deal with, but you're going to make a lot of money. And like, it was weird to me that it would see, be like that, right? Because you think of it as like touristy. Tourists are well known for often not being big tippers and whatever. But like, this is a legend of the Bubba Gump Shrimp Company, which was came about after the movie. And I just remember that everywhere I went, I heard this story from somebody, almost like it was like a hypnotic trigger or a clue or something of just like what you said about when the sky, the earth meets the sky or, or whatever, right? So I don't know if that has to do anything, but that came right to my mind. And then when you got into talking about, um, he was always in these historical places, right? These historical events kind of stuff and time travel. I started thinking about the chocolates. Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get, right? So like the implication being sort of like, you don't, you bite into cho a piece of candy and then it's di each one is different. And this is almost like, if we're talking about this in reference to like the Santa Fe Trail, like each freeway exit can leave you in a different time or something like that, right? And if you think about what's inside of chocolates, you get some combination of something that is generally either too sweet, very salty, right? Like very, you know, sometimes like, you know, you like the one with the caramel, but you don't like the one that has like the brandied, you know, at whatever fruit in it, or, you know, there's all these different ones and everyone has their preferences. And like some people will only eat certain ones and you can go find a box of chocolates at someone's house. And if it's half picked through, you bet you can usually guarantee which ones are gonna be left and which ones have been eaten and whatever. And if we thought about this, like in relationship to realities that people choose, right? There are some that are often unexplored or, some that are very common and whatnot. And then now with all these artisan chocolate makers, you have like all these very strange combinations of things in chocolate, right? And it is like a different kind of experience for your senses. You have cacao ceremonies or people are using cacao in like almost a psychedelic or spiritual way or whatever. So I don't know, that came up for me. And then I started thinking about Tom Hanks, right? Like Tom Hanks has been uh, implicated in the pedophilia stuff and the adrenochrome drinking to whatever degree we, you know, give any validity, give validity to that. But you and I this morning and many previous conversations were talking about like the child trafficking is about something more than just boinking children or whatever, right? And he's been in, like he was in big, right? He was in, he was in that one where he's like on an island by himself with his basketball. He's in, uh, he's in volleyball. <laughs> yeah, or volleyball or whatever it is, right? Where it's like, he's the only person on an island kind of thing. He's in the, the uh, uh, Forrest Gump kind of movie. You don't think of him in terms of time traveling movies the same way you would think of certain other actors who do a lot of sci-fi. Tom Hanks hasn't done a lot of sci-fi, right? Oh, and he was the first person that we heard about in terms of COVID. And he was locked up in an, in a an, uh, hotel room in Australia, 
remember? And he was sending, you know, he had a little typewriter or some shit like that. Remember all the weird stories we were hearing about Tom Hanks, right? So like, you know, maybe there's something about his characters and his movies that like launch us into a new timeline that is based on, you know, like maybe that's a sort of a role he's playing. I do think that there's like rumors that he's actually a Rockefeller or, or something like that as well, right? Like I don't, I've never chased that down. So that came to mind. Um, and then you were talking about the Old West and the pictures of the celebrities, right? The other one that's really good is Nick Cade, Nicholas Cade. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then the weirdest thing, and I don't, I'll, I'll ask him to send it to me, but my, my friend Robert Phoenix, who I also do shows with, is, you know, he, he found one of these Old West pictures with a guy that looks exactly like him, right? So there we have someone from the alternative media who has shown up in some of these Old West photographs. I mean, and his was probably the best one I've ever seen. Right, the closest. It literally, do you remember, did I show you that? It literally looked exactly like him. It was crazy. Um, so th that stuff came up, you know, and like, you know, we hear like, you know, the old west stuff is like super legendary. That's one of the things that's going on in Chatsworth is they have like this old west, like little town, unincorporated town set up over there, and that's where they used to shoot all the western movies, like in the middle of the twentieth century. Right. And then they have Rockadine there doing all this stuff with, you know, uh, particle acceleration or space travel, whichever way you prefer to refer to it. Right. So what is this connection between like Old West and very futuristic type of technologies? And then we, and, and the connection would be the railroad. Right. The connection would be the railroad. And we've talked about like you know, that could be a connection between like Randy and I talked about it and you and I, like all of us have, you know, roads that lead back to Scranton, which apparently is where the, the Neuvenbelt entrance to the next world is, right? <laughs> kind of thing. Um, but, you know, the railroads tend to run along, like if you listen to someone like uh, Walter uh, Bosley, like the Telluric Currents and stuff right. like that, right? And so, um, you know, and, and, a, having a railroad somewhere would be an explanation for why you would have people appearing in this space at seemingly out of nowhere, people who weren't normally there suddenly being there and also suddenly going away, right? It creates like um, an explanation for a lot of unusual behaviors, including trafficking, right? All right. A, um, a technology and a story. That yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So the... I so going to like the old west and the the seeing the celebrities in the in the 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 pictures and so one we're 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 making an assumption that they weren't just all Photoshop but just to throw that out there um, and my sense though with the Forrest Gump was more of like a, a me culpa like a, like let me show you how it's done and then when we see the celebrities that's like more of like okay this is like a Forrest Gump scenario where we see yeah. them there like yeah. it's like this is what you're seeing. Like the reason why you're seeing him there and maybe it's kind of like uh, bigger than just like, you know, what we're calling celebrities uh, as you're saying that you saw Robert. Um, life is like a box of chocolates. Like what if that's like also explain like, you know, told to the person who's about to come into this portal. Uh, the idea what you're saying with the, the railroad and the rail stations, particularly large ones uh, being um, covers for entering in and, and, and leaving because it's like, yeah, of course, someone who you haven't seen before is going to show up and walk right outside of walk right outside of the train station. Like there's a reason why. So that that definitely makes sense. And I and I want to I want to throw this out. Um, when I was talking to you and Laura, when you guys were first taking your trip out, um, when you guys were going east and you're in Utah. And I'm like, well, where are you in Utah? Utah is a big state, right? Yeah. And then you told me where you were and you were like very, very close within, uh, you were about to cross within 10 miles of where the the Utah um, thing was found. Wow. And then, it dis yeah. and then uh, the monolith was found. And so I find that like, you know, just kind of like tied in because it's like beginning to recognize like, you know, well, you were there and the timing was there. And for whatever reason, that's in my mind. And I decide to look at it right when you're driving and we could see it and then it disappears. Yeah. And then it disappears. So we're, we're certainly like playing with, with, um, did you, okay. So in the, it's a couple things in the TV show fringe, right. 
there's a few episodes where there's these beacons that pop out of the ground. They're like these metal spiral things with a blue light in them and they drill up from under the ground. And they're like beacons of like, so there's one, you can like, there's one uh, episode called It Has Arrived or the scene is called It Has Arrived. And that's where you see the first beacon. And then there's another one that pops up in a forest at a really important point between September and Walter relating to like trade off between the various realities kind of thing. And when I saw these monoliths, I was thinking about the beacons that pop up from the ground in, in, in fringe, right? But it is weird. Like it popped up there as we, like in the day, the day before we were approaching Utah and then it literally disappeared a day or two after we went away from there. So that is kind of unusual. So that stuff is neat, but the beacons of fringe, if people remember, I was trying to look for a clip where I could show you one when we were having that conversation about the monolith, but I couldn't, I, I don't know, I couldn't find a little video clip of it. But I wanted to say one more thing in response to what you talked about, about um, when I was having trouble with my depth perception on the road, okay? so. That was the evening we were we were going to stay in this place called Colby, Kansas, right? And Colby, Kansas is where we would eventually split off and take the different road that we came. So it was the night before we got on the Santa Fe Trail, I think, but it was in those last few hundred, like the last hundred miles before we were approaching it, yeah. right? So we're driving towards Colby, Kansas. Kansas. I'm having all this trouble with depth, per depth perception. We get to Colby, Kansas, and like, it was kind of a weird place. Like the hotel we stayed in, it felt weird to me, that hotel. It felt like a stage set, like, or a prop. Like it was very weird. The, ce the ceilings were like way too high for a regular hotel room. And there was like a weird, the closet looked like, remember those old metal filing cabinets your parents would have like in their office, like in the seventies or eighties? Like that's what the closet was. It was weird. And then there was this bizarre shower that was like a room. It was like, the, the toilet and the sink and stuff was like a normal bathroom. And then there was like almost like a weird walled closet you stepped into and around the corner to get to the shower head. It was very bizarre. It felt, there, and there was an element to it that felt not real to me. And the next morning when we got up to leave, we crossed to the other side of the freeway to go to Starbucks. Mm -hmm. And we went into the, the side that we stayed on the hotel, like masking and all that kind of crap hand sanitizer, social distancing. We go over to the other side of the freeway and we go to this, like, I forget the name of the, it was a Petro stop that has like, it's a gas station and they've got a store inside and then like three or four restaurants, including a Starbucks. And you didn't have to wear a mask in there. And it was like a very unusual store. Remember I came back out and I was like, they have really neat stuff in there. It was like a boutique convenience store. They had like fancy stuff. I was like, I could stay here for a week and buy things. The glass is blown out in the very front part. Oh yeah, and there was a, an entrance, you know how like sometimes there'll be an entrance and then another entrance, there's like a room that sort of separates like the inside and the outside. The glass was blown out of that. That was kind of unusual. But so we went there and then we go to get back in the car and we're, we're trying to decide which road we're gonna go on. And we had decided we were gonna take the old Santa Fe Trail but then somehow we took a wrong turn and we ended up on the road we didn't want to be on but then somehow it turned into the road we did want to be on which was the Santa Fe Trail. It was like confusing. No Right. It was like a confusing, like the, the, her Nigel is what she calls her, like, you know, GPS ways manager app thing. She has it because she uses the British voice. She calls him Nigel. Like it was all confused. Like we went, we went in like a funny disorienting kind of circle and somehow ended up on the right road to the Santa Fe trail. And then that's when this sort of weirdness began, but that moving over from like this place was called Colby, Kansas. And the hotel we stayed in felt like a fake reality. It was bizarre. And then we went on to the other side of the freeway, had this experience at the Petro, and then moved on through the Santa Fe Trail. So there, like, it seems like th that was like a crossover point or a junction of sorts for us as well. I don't know. It was kind of interesting. Huh. Um, so this is slightly off. Right? So I'm interested in this from a couple different ways. Like my sense is, like there, there, there's a, there, there are covers. There are like, there's a false reality. And then there's like, you know, it's like what you're saying with the clouds, like the clouds covering up the cities. And it's like, you know, there's like under uh, in the sky when we're talking about in the beginning, like, so there's an idea of there's something that is hiding the city. And then there's the city itself. And I'm just as interested in identifying the clouds. Do you mm -hmm. under, are you following me on this metaphor? Yeah. 
you know, and seeing. So like, I think like a lot of the movies, a lot of like all this stuff, which we know are, um, are, are clouds, you know, they're, mm-hmm. they're these, they're the, the camouflage to something else. So we could go and look at what the something else is, which is being hidden, or we could, and we can also go and look into what is the, what, what, how are they hiding it? Because that way we could begin to understand like how to see other things. Um, <laughs> I have thought. <laughs> So I just want to throw this out there. And this is what was popping in my mind as we're talking about a lot of this, because once you begin to understand the modus operandi, the techniques of how it's done, then you can apply that in many, many different scenarios. Um, and you could do the geocaching, if you will. You start, it starts becoming a different game. Like geocaching provides you a game in reality that you didn't realize. Like you don't realize other people are playing this game. You're just going from point A to B and they're like finding all sorts of treasures. So have you ever heard of the villages? Have we ever talked about that? It's in Florida? No. All right. So it's where my parents live. And, and if anyone's on the East Coast or if anyone's of that age, they've probably heard of the villages because it's the largest like... Uh, active adult community in the world it covers like i don't know like a hundred thousand people and every like once a month there'll be like a national news story that comes out of the villages like you know so the villages is uh it was designed by the by the disney's consulting firm (laughs) for fuck's sake (laughs) so disney like you know for better for worse like disney's very good at what they do and what they do is like, uh, you know, in terms of like creating false realities, mm-hmm. they are experts at creating false realities. And like, whether you want to look at this from the mundane level or from something a little bit um, less mundane, um, like, you know, companies or businesses, they're like, we need that expertise. So the Villages was... Uh, was designed by, or at least once it got it started, they brought in the the Disney folks. And and the Villages is located maybe an hour or so outside of Orlando. So like, that's where like you have that Disney connection. And one of the things which they did, whenever I go to the Villages, like it is, it is, I feel very, very uncomfortable. I can't wait to get out of there. And the Villages is 100% like it's a false reality. It's middle of nowhere, Florida, where they created all of these, um, uh, these the Villages. That's why it's called that. And there's a false history throughout the Villages. And throughout the Villages, you're going to see all of these historical markers, like they look like real historical markers that you would see like in, in regular reality. And it tells the story of some guy. Um, I can't remember who it is. And it's like done tongue in cheek. It's done tongue in cheek. But there's this really weird blending of reality because it's everywhere. And what they've done in the villages, every village has a different kind of theme to it. And in terms of execution, in terms of like, you know, the architecture, the scale, the details, like it's Disney, like they nailed it, they did it right. But, and it feels so friggin' weird. So the thought is, if this is happening on this like kind of level, and th- here's the other thing, the reason why my parents are drawn to it because they were drawn to Columbia, Maryland, which is where I grew up, which was a completely, uh, false city environment. Did your parents take you there? Is that where your parents live now? Or is that That's where they, they live now? They've been oh. there for, I don't know, like 10 <laughs> years now. I don't know. I'll go down like once a year. Um, and it's always the same thing. And, and it, to make it even stranger um, is, and I guess maybe this might be true for, for Southern Florida. So maybe you, this is normal for you, but for people who are like, who come from an environment where you have like four very distinct seasons, um, you know, there's no real change in seasons. Everyone's there retired. So there is no like marking of, of your, your, your day-to-day life. There's not a weekend. Saturday is no different than Wednesday because you're not going to, and it creates, it creates an incredibly disorienting environment. Mm-hmm. And so when, when we're talking about these things, like, you know, the, like the, the Colby and like these like strange hotels and like, 
Uh, I think that that is a, a, a technology and a technique which, and, and feeling weird, you know, and I like, you know, I physically and mentally feel strange whenever I go in that environment. I'm, all, I'm always thinking like, you know, what are they, what sort of 5G stuff are they, are they sending out? But maybe it's even more subtle than that. It's just like the lack of time and space and it creates a strange environment. Well, and or maybe whatever line it's on or whatever technology may be under the ground or sort of machinery or particle accelerator or whatever. Okay, there's a couple of things. I'm going to go back and address. So this, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back to something we were at before and then come to, to what you were just talking about. So when you were talking about how they do this, right, with the cloud, because you talk about it as you want to know about the cloud. So a cloud can be like, it's in some ways similar to like, creating vapors or creating smoke or something like that, right? And like this guy that I was talking about before, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Do you know who Sean Gatrell is? Mm -mm. He had this series that he started back in like 2012 called uh, What is in Our Sky? Who, What is in Our Skies, right? And his channel is Industrial Surrealism. And he's an artist and a photographer, but he also ended up doing all this, this investigation into what's going on in our sky. Right. And he discovered that there are these craft that cloak themselves in these cloud like structures, right, that they generate this sort of vapor that disguises them. And he did deep dives into this technology. And the further he went into it, the more lost he was about is this something earthbound? Is this something from like, is this an interdimensional kind of thing? Is this an alien? You know what I mean? Like, he got yeah. to a place where it's like, you know, in the beginning, he was like solely focused on military. And by the end, it's like there's some sort of metaphysical stingrays in the sky. Maybe, you know what I mean? Like what it, it, it just took him into a tons of places. But these things were generating their own cloak, their own craft, their own, like, sorry, their own cover, right? Kind of thing. And so it made me think of like, uh, what is this? What am I on? Oh, so remember in Alice in Wonderland when that one blew out the vapors and it was like, who are you? And it created this big smoke around him. Well, what's a huge trend? And I talked about this in my Sugar as Programmable Matter series, but what's one of the huge trends that we've seen in the last 10 years? Vaping, which creates this incredible amount of like par particulates in the air around you. Have you ever seen how big some of the smoke, yeah. right? Yeah, meth also does the same thing like that when one sm it smokes meth. It's like personal chemtrails. So we're aware of the chemtrails in the sky. Then Sean discovers these things that the craft themselves seem to be generating. And then you've got people generating all of this particulate matter into our environment and atmosphere that I think creates like a like movable movie screen anywhere, right? When you have all this stuff, it creates like something, something that is only real for the amount of time that that stuff is sort of in the air and then it can kind of dissipate or move off somewhere else or whatnot, right? So there's like all of this, there's this substance in the air that is like helpful in creating temporary realities kind of thing, right? So I think that was one thing that I thought of when you were talking about wanting to know what the cloud is, right? Made me think about that. I had a whole, I'll send you some time if you want, like I had a vaping section in my Sugar is Programming Matter, Matter series. And it was about like breathing reality into existence when you're vaping. Like, like you have a certain, like, so you smoke the vape machine, which most people charge them on USB ports. So they could have an app running in them or they can be, they're connected to technology. So they take this huge hit of this crystalline liquid that could be charged or programmed or whatever it goes into their body, sort of <coughs> reads the information or reality from inside of your body. Then they blow it out into their environment and other people then breathe it in. And so I talked about it as like a technology that's used to create a hive mind or a consensus reality or any of that kind of stuff, right? So. Anyway, it just made me, uh, that's kind of what I was thinking about when you were talking about wanting to know what the cloud is. And then as far as the village, the villages, which Steve says he lives close to the villages, um, I, uh, like, for the, like the first thing that popped into my head, I don't know why, it was like, oh, Finder's Cult, lots of stuff goes on in Florida, but that's a different area. Florida, that just came into my head. But then it was like, oh, it's like Westworld, right? So in Westworld, they're in the park. And it's like a fake reality, but it feels like a real, seems like a real reality. And there are narratives and historical markers. And later in the series, you find out that, that there's not just one park. There's another park next to it that is like an Asian reality. So there's the West one, which is like cowboy. Then there's one that is like Asian and like all the Shogun culture. And then there's one that is like some other, there was like three or four different It's just parks. like that. It's right? just like that. Well, there was that. And then it also made me think of Burning Man, where you have the different camps. 
and each camp has like a different theme or a different reality. And of course, it's like Disneyland where you have like Tomorrowland and then like the old West land, the gold, you know, whatever. There's like different air, five or six different kingdoms, right? At, I've never been to Disney World, but at least in Disneyland here. Yes, and of course, the clouds are the cloud, Donna, absolutely, right? When we talk about the, the technological cloud that's storing information, I don't know that there's any difference between that and the quote-unquote clouds we see in the sky. I think they may, they may be telling us the truth with that technology. So those were all of the things that sort of came into my mind. And when you're in Disneyland, right, or when you're at, at Burning Man, like, you know, like, okay, I'm moving from Tomorrowland into this other place, and the rides and the themes are all different, the characters are dressed differently. Same, same at Burning Man, right? And I've talked about the, the connections between Burning Man and Westworld and, and the different things. But in Westworld, the people who were inside the Westworld park did not know that there was another park like right next door to it. They thought that they were in this like one, one of a kind kind of thing, reality, right? And, and even the people, a lot of the people who worked in the Westworld park didn't know that other parks existed, right? So it's very... Um, that's all that I get just all that was swarming at me while you were describing the villages. I'd never heard of it, but it's fascinating to me that your parents chose to move from Columbia, Maryland to the villages in Florida. They, my, my dad took me on vacation when we were little to some little place, some little, I'll ask him the name of it, some little village kind of place in San Diego. And I just like, it stuck in my mind forever. It was like that. It was like this place with little houses and other children were there. And I thought it was so neat and we never went back, but it was in my mind, right? The kind of place that might appeal to a child it wouldn't appeal appeal to me now um but i'd never heard of the villages so very interesting all right back over to you uh so um it's that's a that's really uh, that's interesting i i liked how you were talking about like the the west world analogy and i've seen a little bit of the west world but i'm not that that familiar with like all the details of the show but what 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 jumps out and like particularly and and definitely the the vaping thing i've always like uh it seems to me also like vaping disappeared too or at least was been reduced before there used to be vaping on every corner and now i don't see it anymore um but uh the usb thing i've always been like that should be a very big indicator that it's something you know which you know what it's interacting with but here's the thing which i think is interesting about um about the villages also and creating creating realities or creating, you know, whether it is a village itself, and this is a little bit, a little bit more nebulous. Um, the thing which is unique about the villages is everyone is of a certain age and there's no one there of other ages. Mm -hmm. And so I, I often like, you're, you're aware of like, you know, there, there are people who keep a certain culture alive. Like, you know, I live in Lancaster, so there's the Amish around here. And I always think about the Amish, they keep a certain, like there's a certain way of life which is still alive in on earth because they're doing it. And you could say that with like, like anyone who may be like, you know, of an indigenous type of, of lifestyle, like wherever that may be. And that, that would be another type of keeping a, a, a certain way alive. And so everyone in the villages is keeping this like Forrest Gump, baby boomer sort of, um, uh, uh, mindset, that culture, because if you could start to break up, if you start breaking up like gener cultures by or, or populations by generation, and then the, the ages they were when there were certain experiences, like that is a very, very high concentration. So uh, I think you're kind of, um, there's something there. Um, and it, and we're, we're playing with, and this began with our conversation with Santa Fe and like, you know, whether these are portals or other worlds or, or touching into like other ways of coming in and out of our West world, our village, you know, you talked about maybe, uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear what you got to say about what's the movie called? It's, is it Dark World, Dark City? Dark City, yeah. Dark City, but Dark City in another way, because it deals with the ends of their village, the ends of like their, their, their what's it called, and playing with that because you know, I think what we're describing, we being everyone who's here and everyone who, who you know, are calling ourselves human living in, 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 in uh, like 2020 world, are, we're like bumping up against like the edges of our reality right now, just like they did in that movie. 
Yeah, no, that, I, I mean, one of the things when I was researching the movie is I found, I was trying to figure out what city was being portrayed and there was no answer to it. But what I realized was that there was a 20th anniversary celebration of the movie that was held in many, many cities around the world. And it was like Dark City Vienna, Dark City this and that, Dark City that, right? So it's any city and it's every city, right? Like each city is its own kind of false reality where something like that is going on, right? And then just coincidentally, like one of the guys who did one of the soundtrack sets for these parties was of course, Jeff Mills, who I've talked about before, like the DJ Jeff Mills, right? So he's in on that sort of dark city as a sort of false reality in every city kind of conversation. And the music he did for it is incredibly weird for the, for the anniversary. Um, but uh, yeah, th those false walls, I mean, think about what we're dealing with now in terms of like, not only does every state have different rules in terms of the coronavirus, but basically like every county does as well. And within that, every city, Right, like in Cal we were on a lockdown here in California, but then also in Los Angeles, there's like a tighter set of rules than other places. So in a sense right now, they're really showing us very, very clearly that there is a false reality constructed a different one in every different sort of area or jurisdiction. And there's walls to it, right? When I drive out of Los Angeles and into Orange County, suddenly I can do things that I couldn't do or suddenly I'm permitted, <laughs> right? I can do it whatever I want, whatever I want, but I'm permitted, or there's a different set of imposed uh, lines of reality there, right? Well, well, I, I, I think that what we're talking about here is literally like identifying that, like, you know, all of the things which you're talking about, like, um, like the movie being a little bit metaphorical, but like the, when, when we're, you're describing like the, the the cloud technology when i was saying like how the technology works i was being like in a very general sense like there is cloaking in in ev in multiple contexts you know not just like in the sky but like what Forrest Gump seems to be hinting at a cloaking, your experiences on Santa Fe and like going through these places, like it's cloaking something, like knowing how that works and what we're trying to, what it seems like what, what we're bumping up against is like, you know, again, going to another movie analogy is, is on the dark city where we're seeing like, where does that end? And then there were the, um, it's been a while since I've seen it, but the, um, there, there are there are beings, if you will, that are stopping you from trying to figure that out, or at least that's part of the game. There is a, um, I'll, I'll have to see if I can find anything and then maybe dig into it. There is a, I think it's a visual artist who, who does visuals at parties here in Los Angeles who goes by the name Cloaking. Um, and you know what I mean? And just when you were talking about that, I was like, this might be a person who understands something about the magic of that, you know what I mean? Sort of experience or whatnot. I'm gonna see if I can find any links to his stuff, not right now, but uh, and we can revisit it later, but even maybe like reach out to him and see what sort of is going on with him. But that's, he refers to himself as cloaking, right? So. So um, we've got a little bit, we've got a little bit of time left before we end our first segment, right? Yeah, so let's go, let's get into some of your stuff. So I want to just, so I want to talk about, uh, I mentioned the Zodiac Killer, right? Yeah. So yesterday I watched, um, I watched uh, uh, NBC Nightly News. And I like to do that every once in a while because it's fun. It's like a, it's a guilty little pleasure. I love to see how they're telling the stories. Like, I can't believe that they're telling the story. Like this is, this is when I'm watching, I'm like, I can't believe they're doing that. I can't believe people, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things. I know that I, I, I understand like how I'm like playing into it, but it's, that's what's my guilty pleasure. So I go and I watch yeah. it yesterday. I watch on YouTube, I guess that's, and, and there were, I think, like 1.5 million views. And I watched the day before. So yesterday was, what, the, the 12th? So I watched the 11th. And um, I want to talk, uh, and, and I'll take one more step back. So you ask, who's watching this? Who's watching the nightly news? Who's the audience? And this goes back to, like, you know, it's the villages. Like, most, I would say anyone under the age of 
40, like it's, it's a much smaller percentage of the population that gathers their news from that, from that way. And people who grew up with like the national nightly news being of something of significance, you know, they're the ones who continue to watch it. So that's, that's who this audience is. And so the first thing, which basically how it went, the whole thing was a commercial. The whole thing was a friggin' commercial for COVID. And it was like, they hit all the things. These are the things which you need to know. And like, they're telling you like this story and that story. I did a whole video about this, but there's one thing which I want to point out, which is kind of, uh, which I thought was particularly um, noteworthy and 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 interesting to see how like the story is being propagated. If you could uh, be kind enough to give me the screen share capability. Absolutely, I always forget to hold on. That's the wrong thing to do. Advanced options. There we go. Advanced options. All participants. There we go. Go ahead. All right. So where are we here? Uh, all right. Well, let's go begin with this. Um, Uh, maybe I'm doing the wrong one. Did that change it? Yeah, we see it. Okay, so this begins as the commercial. You see all the commercial. There's Lester Holt. They're like selling you all this sort of stuff. They give you the human interest story. I pull this out because I just love the idea. I'm not saying it's the same person, but I'm saying that this guy here who gives a sob story, like right afterwards they show uh, Cuomo. And I'm like, there's, there's, I'll give it an 8% chance it's the same person, but that's not the point of what I want to show though. I Right? I mean, it looks like it, right? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. like, I'm not even going to get into the whole central casting thing. So we go through all this. Um, and then they tell you, like, literally, this is what they're telling on the news now. Like, at the end, like, this is considered nightly news. Now, nightly news has always been propaganda, of course, but it's gotten so stupid now. And so it's telling people, it's reminding people that they have to do their, their major holiday shipping deadline is coming up. Like, that is major news. And then they have a correspondent who's telling people for other ideas. You might want to buy people streaming membership. Like, this is the world where we are. But in the middle of this story is where it gets interesting. So we could see right here, this is like the, the red line, uh, or like this is the line of the, of the 25 minutes of the news. And here's the midpoint. And in the midpoint, uh, Lester Holt, I think his name is, uh, yeah. he tells the story of the Zodiac Killer because there's been a break in the Zodiac Killer case. Okay. Now, this was a story of interest in the 60s. So this is what? That's uh, 38 plus 20. So so about um, 58 years ago, this was important. This is not important at all. This has no context in reality, right? Unless it has context in a reality of some other level. And what they're saying is the, Kodiak, the Zodiac Killer's riddle is solved after 51 years. So, okay, so it's 51 years ago. Where okay? Where are you? Where are you seeing this? We're still. Oh, on, is this not showing up? Where, why is that not we're, showing we're up? We're still on the, the dead eyes guy with the the guy with that looks like Mario Cuomo, or Chris Cuomo, or whatever. The it's still there. Yeah. Yeah. You have to stop share. Stop share and then go to another one. I think. Yeah. Oh, is that how it works? With all of our technology, I got to do that. Okay. Sometimes it seems to not. Sometimes I, I got it. Around. Yeah, I think that's it because sometimes it works. So here we go. Okay. So here's Lester Holmes. Here's the bottom line, which I was like talking about. I'm glad you got to see the Cuomo thing because that's funny. Um, but right in the middle of like all of that like propaganda story, they drop this tidbit in. Nothing to do with anyone. 51 years ago, there's the Zodiac Killer. And finally, finally is today. Finally today. We have solved the Zodiac Killer cipher. And this is what it says. It says, I hope you're having fun trying to catch me and, you know, some other nonsense. So there's probably in twilight language, you know, there's stuff which is being indicated, but this is being introduced. So Zodiac and all the things which Zodiac is corresponds with, right? You know, with like the, the heavens and like planets and all sorts of stuff. And then also with, with the Zodiac killer. Um, and this is very similar to how the, how, how virus, the virus is kind of being, um, uh, sold to the public in terms of it's like you're never safe it's indiscriminate yeah. and at any given moment you could get killed and this is how this this is how they like sold like you know the serial killers the manson killers all this sort of stuff like at any given moment the person you least expect is going to go and kill you so we have this and then 
and remember, like we all have, it's been, it's been indicated like, uh, uh, like it was the big scientific news about eight years ago that they proved that the human being has the attention span shorter than a goldfish. Remember when that was a big story? Yeah. Like because we can only hold, hold an idea for, for three seconds. seconds. Yeah. So remember, so no one can remember this is the story. They began with COVID, all COVID, COVID, COVID. They told you this, they go back to COVID and then they end with this. Did, did it change or do I have yeah. to stop sharing? No, it changed. All right. So now you can see, if you look closely, let me go and, and make this one smaller. It's at the very end of the red. So this is the end of the show. This is where they told you the Zodiac killer. And then they're like, spectacular sight, breaking news. And we can go and we can see Saturn. And what it is, is it is a, um, it's a, it's a telescope image of Saturn. And if you've ever actually looked at a telescope image of Saturn, this is what it always looks like. You know, there's nothing particularly significant about this. And what is of significance, and someone brought this up in an email to us earlier this week, is the fact that we're coming up to the great conjunction. Saturn and Jupiter are going to be conjunct at zero degrees Aquarius in on the 21st. But at no point, at no point is it brought up that Jupiter and Saturn are going to have a conjunction. And no point is anything about the significance of Saturn being brought up other than the fact that we've got a good image of it. And so how we have mixed into all of this, like, you know, national news story is they're going back and forth. They're like, I'm going to hit you up with this Zodiac killer. I went back to the Zodiac killer. I don't know if that showed up again. And then we're going to conclude with the image and put this in your mind of Saturn. And so, all right, all right, I got, I, I got some stuff. All right. <laughs> all right. So first of all, what struck out at me, what jumped out at me, was that um, you said that uh, the Zodiac kill killer thing was 58 years ago. 57 is a big number for you, and we talked about recently how the JFK. We had the 57th anniversary of the JFK thing, and that. Uh, Donald Trump is going to enact man memorandum 57 that's supposed to go into effect here this in, in, in or first week of January or something like that, right? In which the De Department of Defense will no longer back up the CIA or something I, something like that, right? So that was just interesting to me that we've moved from 57 being the number of focus for a period of time into now we're looking at something that is 58 years old, right? So then I'm looking at the Zodiac killer's time. Uh, uh, little notes. And then I'm thinking, oh, that looks a lot like the language that the observers in Fringe used to write in. So this is the language that the observers in Fringe wrote in. Right? This is like- make that big? Yeah. Let's see if I can make it bigger. Mm, there it is. Yeah. Okay. So, so I was already thinking about that, right? And then you go into, so if, though we have COVID, 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 Zodiac killer, COVID, 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 Saturn, so then probably COVID, right? So there's probably two minutes of space or heavens related information embedded amongst constant fear, nonsense, bullshit, propaganda, da, 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 right? So what's the, what's the connection between the Zodiac killer and Saturn, right? So we're dealing with the heavens, we're dealing with the stars, we're dealing with planets. I think that what the coronavirus is here to do is to distract us from the fact that our idea of space is being killed, right? Like we're, something is like, it, it's, you know, like I don't know if that's gonna happen with the Saturn and whatever the conjunction, but look how much propaganda has come out in the last few weeks about like aliens. And you know, this whole thing with this Israeli scientist saying, oh, the aliens are here, but humans aren't ready. And people don't really understand what an alien is or a UFO is or whatever. And you and I have discussed since the beginning, the, our very first conversation about the misunderstanding of space. Right? Like people think of the planets as being something out there in the far away. They think of the stars as being that, right? Astronomy, astrology all point to that, right? And that's astrology is referred to as the zodiac. And maybe we're going to find out that it's something very different and they have it encoded there right in the news. That's just like everything else right now. There's so many important truths about reality being revealed, but nobody can hear them because all they're talking about is the election and the fucking virus, right? Erection. <laughs> or, yes, we can't say it. We can't talk about election fraud. We have to talk about erection fraud, right? <laughs> or whatever. But that's all. And like, you don't learn anything new when you focus on the information about the coronavirus or the election, right? But if you ignore those topics, there's like amazing things being revealed all over the place every day, right? And so Zodiac Killer and Saturn, right? And, and Saturn is like this weird, this weird shape that, they, that we see 
when I was doing some research for a client on a Boeing facility near where she grew up, she was telling you about this facility called the Boeing Black Hole. The Boeing Black Hole looks like Saturn on the inverse. The parts that are like white are black and vice versa, right? So to me, that's pointing at the idea that what we think of as Saturn is actually under the ground, right? On a certain level. I also saw an interesting video this week. I saved that to find it about how we have a complete misunderstanding of what the planets are and how there's like this sort of time travel drive force between them. That's kind of interesting. I'll see if I can find the video again. Um, but I mean, I think like everything, you say this in all of your work, you say like, this is the inversion and this is the reality, right? You know, so I think maybe our idea of space and the heavens and all that kind of stuff, it's, the, it's, it's killed, like, you know, right? So the Zodiac killer is, you know, like there's something in that coded language there that tells us the truth about a reality. That coded language he writes in, this coded language that's shown in Fringe, right, kind of thing. And, you know, the, the, the observers in Fringe are these very strange characters that sort of move in and out of time. In a very, they're, very, they, they're very similar in some ways to the strangers in Dark City that sort of, right, can do all this sort of weird telepathic stuff and traverse like spaces very easily in different ways than we do and whatnot, because they understand what, what space actually is. And we think it's some fucking stupid thing up there with like shit, you know what I mean? Like even in the end of Dark City, they move the guy, Rufus Soul moves the city, the flat earth from the space down into the water, right? And I think the water is much closer to our reality than the space reality. Yeah. Yeah. So to me, that was just like literally like a minute or two of, of embedded reality in a bunch of a sea of bullshit. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think you're right. <laughs> I think I think you're you're undoubtedly right with that. So, all right, let's see what people are talking about over here. Uh, so Michael said that that same guy that you brought up is the one who Robert Phoenix constantly refers to as the dead eyes guy. So he must be a, um, a an actor who appears in a lot of these kinds of videos. If Robert has a name for him, <laughs> the, which one would that be? Would that be Lester Holt, or would no, that be the one who looks like Cuomo? Oh, the one who looks like Cuomo, he's, he does a lot of roles. He's, uh, um, that's, that's funny. I, uh, um, yeah. so, and that was something else, which, and, and I just did this, uh, it was talked about this in this other video was I started going into like, kind of like what you were saying, um, when we were talking about the cloaking and, um, and I watched, I watched this past week, I watched Wag the Dog again. Have you seen, mm -hmm. do you remember Wag the Dog? I don't think I've seen Wang the Dog. I think I heard my dad talk about it a lot when I was younger, but I don't think I've seen it. So Wag the Dog was Wag the Dog was made in the 90s and it was Barry Levinson film. And it was like first like kind of and it, the, the premise was there was like a presidential scandal and then they hired this like political fixer and he used a Hollywood producer and they created just false wars and they got him on the news and everyone believed there was this war and there was no war going on. The whole thing was just made up and like how, how easily that was, that was sold yeah. to the public. Like they do, yes. <laughs> and when that came out in the nineties, like most people looked at that as metaphor. Mm -hmm. Right. No. Nope. And then like after 2000, like after like 9-11, then particularly after like, you know, uh, uh, Sandy Hook, like everyone's like, oh, maybe that you got to watch that again. They're telling you this is how it's done. And now when you watch it after after uh, um, after, uh, you know, everything which we've seen si this year with COVID, like you're beginning to see like you it's even more ridiculous than like, you know, you thought you got it like in 2012, you thought you got it in 2016, but now you're like, no, it is, it is so ridiculously like it, everything's a lie. So the re what, what I found interesting about this, or it, I, I was interested for it for a couple of reasons. One was seeing it again with like, you know, post COVID eyes, but then secondly, um, back when like, you know, I, I want to probably was in the in the first ha uh, like 2010 sort of time frame when like all of the Stanley Kubrick stuff started coming out Stanley Kubrick and Eyes Wide Shut and like Moon Landing and Stanley Kubrick and like that and he he was telling everyone what was going on and a lot of that was at least for me it was put forth by the um the the Jay Widener um the Jay Widener documentary 
uh, series. And I, I remember I bought those and, mm -hmm. and they're fantastic, really, really good stuff. And I watched everything you had to say at that time. And I remember there was something that was said that stuck in my mind. Um, and what it was, uh, Jay was when, when telling the story of how, uh, of Stanley Kubrick and how he was, um, how he was killed because he would not change the um he would not change the editing of eyes wide shut uh jay said that stanley kubrick had a gold pass from hollywood he was like because he did the moon landing he was able to negotiate that he got final say on every one of his films and the studio's heads couldn't say anything and and jay widener said he's like the old uh stanley kubrick and only one other person in hollywood had that that cap that um that ability and that was barry levinson uh -huh. And and I remember that and uh, that stuck in my memory because my mother went to high school with with Barry Levinson. Of course. Yeah, of course. Right. <laughs> and, so, and I used to always wonder. I was like, I get like I understood the logic of like the Stanley Kubrick. But I'm like, why Barry Levinson? I mean, like, maybe you get that if you like you just made like blockbuster after blockbuster, like billions and billions of dollars. But like he had some successful films and some good films. But like, you know, there are other directors who had more successful films. And so it can't be about the dollars. It's got to be something else. And so I I go and I watch this movie, this wag the dog again. And I still have that in the back of my mind and I'm watching it. And so the, um, the producer who is like in, who, who fakes the whole thing, uh, his name is Stanley. And I'm like, oh, it's always interesting also because Stanley Kubrick did this film called Barry Lydon. And so, you know, now we've got like, it's not exactly the same. And the way that the Stanley character is being portrayed in Wag the Dog is totally different than the way Stanley Kubrick is portrayed in all the things which we know about Stanley Kubrick. And then I'm like, motherfucker, there's no such thing. All of that's made up. All yeah. of it's made up. I'm not buying any of it. Yeah, I mean, and so I think that's where we're starting to get to as with like beginning to recognize where this where the 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 endpoints of our reality and what we take to be true as we're trying to figure it out, because a lot of the things which we have been just as what you're saying with the space, it's like, no, all of it, like all of these things to look at. And particularly as it relates to like, you know, you, you were saying like, you know, is the trafficking being a little bit different? Uh, I think this also ties into the fact that we've been sold a false good on what the trafficking's all about, or a false story on what the, the trafficking's about as well. Yeah. Uh, so no. A big one to drop on at the end of the show, but <laughs> that's where I wanted to go with that. Well, I think a couple of things. So I think that that's where, I mean, we've been pointing to this for a while in terms of that there really are no barriers. The barriers exist for us. They create these walls of perception of this is the fiction, this is the reality, this is the documentary that is fictionalizing reality or real, making more real the fiction. And, and they, so we have them segmented in our minds, but the people who are performing this magic know that there is no boundary and barrier between them, that it's all fake, that the whole fucking thing is fake, right? And so, I mean, I think this is like the next sort of logical step for us in some ways. Um, Barry, what's weird is you're like, why did my, like, you know, so two things. I think the reason that they had golden passes were just because they were like, they were charged or particularly good at re uh, perception, reality perception management, right? Like they exist, like, so some, both if Barry Levinson did Wag the Dog and Stanley Kubrick did all these movies. Like they're the next level of people who are questioning the nature of reality, like those people's work, right? Oh, Barry Levinson revealed the fact that we live in a propaganda run reality. Oh, Stanley Kubrick, you know, there's something about his work takes us up to that edge of is the moon landing fake or real or, or you know, is this uh, sex parties real or fake or whatever, right? And so people have gone there and been like, oh, they're telling us the truth here. When really it was just like the further widening of the margins on the paper. We're still on the paper though. We're not off the desk for sure, right? So I think they, those two maybe had a particular knack for sort of creating that slightly wider margin that made people think they were off the reservation, but really they weren't, right? So I think that may be like their, their gift and why they had a special set of rules for them. And then I hadn't thought also while I'm listening to you, my mind is still going over something 
something else that two things. Your mom went to high school with uh, Barry Levinson. You know who my dad went to high school with? Michael Milken. Remember Michael Milken with the whole like financial? Yeah, yeah, the bond trader. Like weird, right? Like why did my dad, like bizarre kind of stuff. So it's another one of those where it's like, huh, right? But as you're telling all these stories, my mind is still sometimes going back to like the vapor thing. Like what's going on with the vapor or the cloud or whatever. And then I started thinking about um, John Lilly's solid state. That was part of his uh, echo coincidence control uh, mantra document. I don't know if you caught it, but in the second episode of Man in the High Castle, there's a sign in the background that looks like a movie theater sign that says solid state TV, right? And so there's something about that space, which like there's a solid state and then there's a fluid state and this sort of cloud vapor gaseous state is the transformative space sort of in between mm -hmm. that is really important in this magic. And I started to think about two people like have a funny, every like I've heard this story many times, people have a funny obsession with dry ice. Even grown men, they like to play with it. They like to watch that sort of haze and fog that's created if you put it in water, right? But also at like musical events and parties and, and things like that, they have fog machines, right? And we're not really 100% certain on what's being blown out in that fog. And a place where a lot of um, uh, different realities were created were in rave scenes, underground dance music scenes, concerts, nightclubs, all that kind of stuff, right? And, and so that was coming to me with this whole solid state vapor cloud kind of thing as well. So I'm just putting that out there as uh, we talked about starting to pin topics for discussions at some point, because we just generate so many of them, but those things were kind of rolling through my mind as well. So. All right, I, I just gotta, uh, can I give one last thing and then we'll, we'll wrap yes. it. Uh, so uh, can it screen share again, da, 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 here. Um, you see this right here? Yeah. So this was like part of like the the yeah. the the COVID like uh, yeah. commercial which they gave you for twenty five minutes, yeah. and it was all about um, the dry ice companies and how they had to uh, and how amazing the dry ice companies are because that's what's needed for the um, for the shipping of the vaccine because it has to be so cold. Yeah. Yeah. Just like the same temperature which D wave needs to work at yeah. minus seventy degrees. We talked so, about. But this is what. I'll go a little bit further. I didn't. I didn't say this. This is what I think. Uh, what What is unique to both Stanley Kubrick and and Levinson? What they What they've done. So, do you know the? Did this show up? Did I change my screen on you? Yep. Okay. So, did you ever see the movie Two Thirty Seven? Room Two Thirty Seven. No, I feel like I heard about it, but I. The don't documentary. Think. It's about Kubrick, and basically what it is okay. that it's got a whole bunch of people who analyze um, who analyze The Shining. Okay. You know, supposedly, uh, you know, in uh, Colorado for you. And what the, the real takeaway from 237 is if um, Stanley Kubrick is such a great filmmaker and he's got so much going on and changing in the background that it will meet each person wherever they are, because there are different, totally different, yeah. you know, there's the moon landing, there's the, there's the, the, the Native Americans, there's the Holocaust, there's like a hundred different stories. And each person went through and was given the opportunity to explain how they came to their conclusions. And they all have like a lot of good information to work with. All right. Mm -hmm. And so what we see here is um, the ability of this as a filmmaker to be able to go and work with people on that level of consciousness that they're going to be able to see what they want, but it's going to be in the language of um, on the language of their own internal dialogue, whatever their hot buttons are. And so that means always media gets into a deeper part of psyche, a deeper part of consciousness. But uh, we know that that particularly with 2001 and the monolith and all that stuff, Stanley Kubrick does that very well. Now is here's that, where, it, yeah. this is where we get where the rubber meets the road. Did I change screens for you? Yep. Okay, so this is, a, this is an article from Vanity Fair from 2012. Um, Vanity Fair is arguably as highbrow pop culture as you're gonna get, right? Yeah. All right, so this is a story about Barry Levinson and his comedy Diner. Okay. It was the first movie he did. And here's the reason. Here's where it gets even stranger. The reason why I remember that my mom went to high school with Barry Levinson is because the movie Diner is about a bunch of guys who Barry Levinson went to high school with in the 50s. And that was a big deal in my household because my mom knew everyone in Diner. 
Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. So anyway, so what, what, what they're telling us here in this article is that um, for a little movie without special effects, dramatic reveals, or oh. cutting edge sex scenes, a movie about nothing at all, really, Barry Levinson's 1982 comedy Diner caused a tectonic shift in popular culture. It paved the way for Seinfeld, Pulp Fiction, and The Office. So what it's saying is that Barry Levinson introduced the yep. technique of TV or programming about nothing. Yep. So what is to programming about nothing? It is resonance with the dream world. A dream is a story about nothing. There's no beginning. There's no middle. There's no end. You you're just wake up in it. You have an experience and then it changes. And so what it's showing is Barry Levinson introduced this technique of creating a resonance with the dream world of the viewer. Yeah, absolutely. It also sounds to me like a complete revelation of the fact that reality is, is not real either. Right, like even this real, this place he used to like, right? The acknowledgement that like the story is about his experience with these kids he knew from high school would go to this diner, but acknowledging that that was fake too. Like the, the, the entire reality is fake. So, you know, like, I mean, when you say that this is a shows about nothing, it's because, you know, like I always say that like the best songs, depending on your level of perception are either, either about absolutely nothing or about the whole fucking thing. Like everything, like they're so important or they're absolutely meaningless. You can't tell the difference. It's all really like perception. But what you were saying about Stanley Kubrick and it meets the, the user where it's at, it's kind of like a crystal ball, right? Or like a talisman that means something special to, it's different to each person who has one kind of thing or like a prism, like the way the light reflects off is gonna like be perceived different to people standing and looking at the crystal or the prism from a different angle, right? It's completely, like there's no two people that are going to come away from his work with the exact same perception. At least somebody who's looking at it deeply not. They're going to think it's about whatever sort of narrative that is important to them or that they understand or, or, or whatever it is. Right. So, yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Well, that was a, we, we did pack a lot into that one. That was pretty yeah, good. All right. So we're going to take a five minute break and then we're going to come back and do our workshop. If you guys would like to join us for, Project Kids, which is going to be, we're going to be making some changes that are very exciting, which we're going to tell the group about in just a minute. But um, if you guys would like to join us for Project Kids, please just contact me. Uh, you can do it in email, it's down below, or you can go to patreon.com forward slash media so you can join us for this uh, ever evolving experience. You can find Michael at SusquehannaAlchemy.com. You know where to find me, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. All right, bye.